Will the cost of governance ever be reduced? And with the violence for violence threat, how safe is the Edo state election? This is Plus Politics, and I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. The cost of governance conversation is back. And this time, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila, is a source of the call. He stated that there is a need to impose deep cuts in order to free up revenue for infrastructure development, while adding that the nation is facing a fiscal crisis compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. A similar call was made by former Vice President Atiku Abubakar in May 2020. But what is the country doing to achieve this? Joining us to discuss this is uh, Mr. Nekabari Anna, a legal practitioner via Zoom, and Mukta Halilu Modibo, a community engagement officer at Connected Development via phone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Thank very you much for having me. I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Nekabari. I, I want to, from your perspective, help us break down areas that are taking the biggest deep into government coffers that we must, if we, I mean, if we're serious about taking action, uh, these are the places that we must start from. We have to look carefully at the three arms of government. Basically, the executive and the legislature. Nigeria as a nation has 44 ministers. The United States of America has 23 ministers from 50 states. Now, what is the cost of maintaining 44 ministers? Each of these 44 ministers have a chief of staff. If the 44 ministers have SSA, SA, PAs, the chief of staffs have SSAs, SAs, and PAs. And the list goes on and on. Again, Nigeria has too many parastatals and commissions, all performing functions that are overlapping. For example, the Nigerian Safety Administration and Maritime, and Maritime Agency, NIMASA, is doing the same function like the Federal Inland Waterway Commission is also doing. So the question is, why do we have hundreds of staff in NIMASA hundreds of staff in Federal Iran, in, uh, federal Waterways Agency, instead of collapsing these, do we actually need 44 ministries? Have the 44 ministers performed? Then you go to the legislature. Each of these legislators have chief of staffs, SAs, SSAs, PAs in Abuja. They also have the same retinue of staff in their home states in their senatorial districts, in their federal constituencies. The question is, do we need all of these? Each of these honorable members are given cars as honorable members. If you're a principal officer, for that position, you also have another car. If you are a member of a committee, chairman, chairperson, or secretary of the committee, you also have another vehicle to fill that purpose. Each of these vehicles do not come cheap. Recently, you had how much was spent, billions of naira, over 30 billion naira used in buying vehicles for National Assembly members who already have vehicles. Is this the kind of country we want to continue to operate? These are the ingredients that we look at the cost of governance. Again, if all these retinue of staff are actually contributing anything to national development and cohesion, we will not even complain. The question is, what is the productivity of these honorable members and their retinue of staff, both in Abuja and in the Senatorial District and federal constituencies? How much money do these men use in oversight visits? What comes out of these oversight visits at the end of the day? Let us not be overly critical. These honorable members are making laws for the country. These honorable members need a measure of comfort to do their job. But compare the role played by these honorable members to the honorable members in Sweden. Every member of the Swedish parliament is part-time. Every member of the Swedish parliament is given an accommodation in the capital of that country. And during the period you are doing your official function, your wife, your children, your family members are not allowed to come to that house and stay overnight. 
If they stay overnight, you pay for the extra gas they use, you pay for the extra water they use. Every member of the Swedish parliament travels by public transportation, except for special purposes. Now, can you compare the development in Nigeria to the development in Sweden? Where is Nigeria's GDP compared to the Swedish GDP? Yeah, I, I, I want you to go on. To understand uh, Mr. Nekabari, Nigeria, I, I, I want you to also, you know, extend, you know, from what you are saying before we move to Mr. Mukhtar. Um, a, a lot of people, when you hear about, you know, um, cost of governance, a lot of people always focus on the executive um, or focus on the legislative arm. Um, but I, I want us to talk about, I want you to talk about where this belief that the country can afford all these SSAs and afford all these entourages and afford all these excesses comes from. And where do we start from if we are serious about stopping it? If we are serious about stopping it, the first thing we need to do is for the President Commander-in-Chief, General Muhammadu Buhari, to lead by example. He must, first of all, cut down the number of ministers he has. If he does that, the governors in the states will follow suit. Because every federal ministry at the federal level is also replicated at the state level. So the president must show example. The vice president must show example. The speaker himself, who made the call, should show example. He has a large retinue of staff. If he feels Nigeria has... We, we require deep cuts in the cost of governance, then he should lead by example. Today is not the first time we've been talking about cost of governance in Nigeria. And little wonder some persons have said that Nigeria should revert the parliamentary system of government. I am not endorsing the parliamentary system of government. However, it's not going to be a bad idea because under the parliamentary system of government, lawmakers also serve as ministers. So imagine a situation where we have 44 ministers who are also members of parliament. Imagine how much money Nigeria is going to save. Then, very interestingly, the ostentatious lifestyle of the honorable members and members of the executive branch is also, is also it, it, it's mind-boggling. It's not something anybody wants to see. All right. Charity should begin at home. The president, every principal officer of the National Assembly, must begin to do the same thing. Nigeria should also demand service from those they've elected into public office. And it is because Nigerians are not demanding service, and Nigerians don't demand service because the government is not funding education. Education is the only thing that can liberate the minds of the people. When the minds of the people are liberated, right. they will not right. ask for 5,000 Naira to vote during elections. They will not see an honorable member and clap for him when there is no road to his village. They will not see the president coming to his village and the tire up asks for him when there is no water in Dwara. All right, hold on. So hold on, on um, Mr. Nekabari, hold on. I want to bring in um, uh, Mr. Mukhtar now. Um, um, and it's a great way that we kicked off the conversation, you know, by first of all establishing that it's not just the legislative arm which mm -hmm. um, is to blame when we talk about the high cost of governance. So, uh, Mr. Mukhtar, I want you to also speak about this. Um, the executive arm of government, and of course that includes even states, um, the several Esther codes that run into millions of Naira every year. Um, how do you think that, you know, this type of spending can be reduced? Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to just um, align myself with what the first guest said. You know, if you look at from 2016 to 2020 today, 635 billion as an allocation went to the legislature. Now, in 2016, 115 billion. In 2017, 125 billion. In 2018, 139.5 billion. In 2019, 128 billion. And in 2020, presently, 128 billion. Now, the question that comes to our head is, what is this allocation being used for? Is there anything that is on ground that we have seen that is being done by them that's worth that kind of money? You know, it's a big question to ourselves. 
Now, if we go back to, 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 to now look at our overhead allocation in this country today, in 2019, we're we are talking about 26.8 billion. And, you know, we have in 2020, we're talking about 448.56 billion. Now, so, so you, you will be asking yourself, all this money going in to, to just one number of people when there are other people that are suffering from a problem that that particular money can solve. Now, I'll give you an example. Now, like if we're talking about unemployment in Nigeria, let's just look at the, the, the dynamics of unemployment. In quarter two of 2020, we have 27.1 unemployed youth. From 23.1% from, from of Q3 of 2018, we jumped to 27.1% in Q2 of 2020. Now, if that same money is being used for unemployment, what do you think? Over 200,000 people will, get, will, 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 will be employed. So, so the whole thing, I think, is we need to really be looking at out all these things to now be projecting the whole uh, 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 system of governance and then the whole uh, uh, way the government spent on from the SSA, the SA, the, the ministers, you know, the way we empowered the, 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 the legislative arm of government and, and, and what have you. What do you think? What do you think um, would make this particular call different? Because I'm going to add uh, something. I believe security votes are also part of the things that you can also mention as uh, things that we are, um, of course, expanding that needs to also be looked closer um, into. But what do you think will be, or do you feel that we will get to a breaking point where we would then say this ship cannot continue to sail if we continue spending like this? Yes, yes. One, 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 one fundamental thing we need to do as a country is we let's begin to see uh, citizens as, as, as stakeholders. Let's begin to do things with the citizen, by the citizen, and for the citizen. Now, let's begin to reduce the cost or the allocation that goes to the executive, the legislative, and, and other, other things that that costs a lot of uh, cost to us as governance. Let's begin to invest in, in, in education. Let's begin to invest more in health. Because now 90% of Ni the health expenses in Nigeria are being paid by citizens. It's only 3% of the citizens that are on health insurance in this country. Then what are we saying? So I think we need to begin to look at citizens as stakeholders and begin to do things with them by them and for them. All right, I'm going to go back to um, uh, Mr. And I, I want you to speak on. Um, this is obviously not the first time we're having you know a conversation like this in the last decade. It's not the first time that we're having a conversation on the cost of governance um, without you know anything changing. Do you feel that the statement by the Speaker of the House, Femi Bajabiamila, um, this time will make any difference? And also, do you think that we will get to a breaking point where we, it would you know, be an obvious um, a step that must be taken if not the, the ship you know, would stop sailing? All right, there are two parts to your questions. First, do we think, do I think we are going to make any turnaround this time? Yeah. My obvious answer is no. My obvious answer is no because the citizens are not engaged in the governance of the country. The citizens of Nigeria are not allowed to freely choose their leaders. It is only when we get to a point where the citizens freely choose their leaders and these leaders know I will not be in this office without the vote of the citizens that we will get to that point. So for now, no. But in future, likely. You see, a philosopher once said, the haves should begin to help the have-nots. If nothing is done to assist them, a time will come when the majority have-nots will wage war against the haves, and the haves will have it difficult to have what they have. But do we need to get there? 
Pardon? Do we need to get to that point further? Steps we do not need to get to that point. We do not need to get to that point. But it is obvious to every onlooker, even those who are not careful onlookers, that the leadership class in the Federal Republic of Nigeria do not care about the citizens. And when hunger gets to the point where the citizens no longer have even the dairy and the water to soak, it's going to be a pity for the country. You asked me a question earlier, and your question is, how can we cut the cost of governance? Yeah. The president of Uganda announced sometime early this year that government officials will not be given any new vehicles for the next three years. We say we are the giant of Africa. Please let us emulate what is good. Do you know how much money is going to be saved if they ask them, use the Lexus Jeeps, the Toyota Jeeps, the Mercedes Jeeps that we bought for you, use it carefully, no vehicle we bought for you for the next three years. The money that will be saved from vehicles alone for ministers, honorable members, distinguished senators, commissions and parastatals is going to build lots of hospitals in this country. It's going to fix our schools. It's going to fix our roads. But that point will never come when the citizens do not demand service from the leaders. And I say we cannot get to it at this point. Why? Because the political class is using hunger as a weapon. As long as you are hungry, you cannot question them because you need money to survive. And so a common man on the street will tell you, oh, what is there? If it is this 5,000 Naira I'm going to take from them, and that is all I'm going to get in the next four years, let me just take a, a manager like that. And that is what we see every day. All right. The religious all right. leaders... Go ahead, please. Go ahead. The religious leaders also have a role to play. Religious leaders no longer tell the political class the truth. During the military era, religious leaders fought the military government to the standstill. But today, religious leaders are in an unholy romance, an unholy alliance with political leaders who do not care about the citizens. The religious class do not give comfort to the citizens. The political class do not give comfort to the citizens. Why? Because of that unholy alliance. Kennedy Allen's, a poet once said, in his poem titled Tidal Waves, he said, I shall return in the fury of a tidal wave to cleanse the land of filthiness of wickedness. I shall return when the wolves exhaust their ravenous rage to douse the dirge of mourners, to tear the sacklet of this potency, to tear the blanket of black clouds beclouding our land. That blanket of black cloud beclouding Nigeria today we will only go away, not completely, no matter what we do, when we begin to demand service. When we cut the cost of governance and build schools in my community, Weberebo, Uwe, River State. When we cut the cost of governance and build hospitals, good hospitals in Doara, in Zango Kataf, in Aboni, my River State. Yeah. When the people yeah. begin to see that, yes, our leaders care about us. We are going to see these things materialize. All right, Mukta. But for now, Mukta, um, I, apologies to Mr. Nekabari. Uh, Mukta, I want you. I want you to quickly also chip in your thoughts here because I feel um, this is something that um, is a conversation that you know should never end until something is done. Um, does it, you know, of course, feel the same way for you that this is just once again another political statement? Because every now and then. It almost feels like every time that there's a, it is a new, for example, a new inspector general of police, um, he always gives the order to re remove all roadblocks, gives the same orders to withdraw all policemen that are attached to private citizens, but nothing changes. So does this hurt you now that you're here and once again, Femi Guadjabia Mila, uh, making a statement like this and you in your heart already know that nothing is going to change? Yeah, um, to me, at some point, 90% of what I believe is just a political statement. But I will still, as someone that have hope for the country, I will give 10% to, to, to something that is here yeah, we're going to see change. Because if you really look at it, I think the government needs to begin to create that point of legitimacy to the citizen. From, from being legitimate, they need to move to being credible. And from being credible, they need to be 
uh, allow citizens to hold them accountable. And by allowing citizens to hold them accountable, that is when they will provide service because it's going to be a participatory thing. The governance is going to be a participatory thing and they're providing service. They will have the power back because if you really look at it, if we are living in a country that, you know, if you're poor in Nigeria, you're among the poorest in the whole world. So we, we, we lack the basic health. We lack the basic education. We lack the basic infrastructure. So I think it is, it's going to remain a political statement when the government does not come to bring citizens as stakeholders to begin to do budgeting participatory, the governance in a participatory way, to bring the citizen for citizens to say this is what we want and the government will go ahead to implement it while the citizen monitor and support what the government is doing. If the government does not allow that credibility, legitimacy, accountability, service and power, I think is this is just another political statement. Do you do you feel that the citizens can demand that level of credibility and openness with the government? I think the first thing is the government needs to show that point of credibility before the system. Because if you really look at it, democracy is all about caution and answer. The government, the people in government, our leaders went to communities to ask for caution. But for me, and these guys did their own answer by voting for them. Today they are in power. It's left for us as citizens to ask them caution. And I think there are enough and enough of citizens, it, it's not all, but a, a majority number of citizens are standing up to ask for caution. So I think we demand that answer. You know, we still have a problem in state. You go to a state and use the freedom of information law, and a state governor or a state commissioner or a farm set in a ministry will tell you that this law is not being domesticated. I don't know what that means. But, you know, we need to begin to see our government in a credible way. We need to begin to believe what government says before we can really hold the government accountable and before government will provide service to have power over us. I think there is that point of government allowing citizens to really understand the credibility part of the governance, the legitimacy part of the governance, and then for the citizen to hold government accountable. All right. Um, and of course, back to Mr. Nekabari. There is every state, I believe, has um, uh, an auditor general. There's also the auditor general of the whole federation. Um, and um, it, it doesn't seem like these you know, offices really and truly um, do anything to, you know, at least cut down the cost of governance, at least, you know, play one, one little role here and there to, you know, checkmate excess in government spending. Um, it also doesn't seem like, you know, the legislators are ever going to ask or push legislation of National Assembly members, sorry, would ever push legislation to reduce their salaries or allowances. Um, how can citizens, before we go, how can citizens demand that these things are done before it's too late? Basically, the citizens should have self-discipline and be patriotic. If you have self-discipline and somebody comes to you during the election circle and say, I need your vote. The first thing you ask yourself is, this man that says he wants to be a local government chairman, what kind of person is he? What's the source of his income? What has he done before? What kind of business has he successfully managed? If we ask that question, that's the first place to start. The second is to avoid greed and not buy the, the, the lie that is sold every election circle among the political parties that they want to change the country or they want to make life better for the country. If somebody is unable to care for his household, for his family, how can he care for the country? We need to ask questions. The truth is this. I said earlier that hunger is being used as a weapon. Lack of funding for education 
is also being used as a weapon to keep the proletarites, the Amharites, people of the land, to remain where they are. So, it is self-discipline, the ability to say no to peanuts, the ability to remove fear and to ask the right questions, knowing that the 5,000 Naira, or even in some places, they give them 15 Naira. The ability to say, no, I don't want this money, is the first place to start. And that's why non-governmental organizations, religious leaders, should begin to engage the citizens now. The moment you get to the election cycle, you see lots of non-governmental organizations in a flurry of activities to say they are doing election, election advisories. But it is now that the citizens want it. All right. Nigeria does not have a middle class. There is absolute hunger in the land. Go to hospitals. You will see people dying due to avoidable illnesses. Non-governmental organizations, religious leaders, and the citizens themselves. Citizens should be the police themselves. Until the citizens decide to say, oh, I want to be the police officer. I will not collect gratification. I will not clap hands for a politician who has not built a bridge in my community. I will not go and tie a shwebi for a politician who has eaten the money for the road project in my community. You see what's happened in the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. A minister tells you, I spent 600 and something billion for feeding during lockdown. Schools are not open. Everybody is quiet. A large section of the media is also quiet. Nobody is saying anything because of the people she is connected to. So the media too also has a role to play. Corruption has to be exposed. People, political office holders who do not want to do what they are supposed to do should begin to be booed on the streets. By the time we get to a point, we are not calling for violence. I said boo. Civil disobedience. When they see that people no longer tolerate their excesses, I bet you they will sit down and begin to engage the citizens constructively. Okay. The National Assembly members will, will never reduce their allocations. The executives, in fact, they will even create more ministries to help and, and, and settle their cronies. Yeah. But the citizenship police will be the turnaround. Hopefully it wouldn't be too late at that time. Um, of course, um, I would like to have uh, Mukta um, in less than a minute, if, if you can, quickly say uh, quick uh, words uh, to wrap up for us. Yeah, I think the, the, the only thing I will say is to align myself with what he said. Let's begin to hold government accountable and let's begin to engage government with power with, not power over. Nobody have power over anybody. We entrust them to be there and we have the power to bring them back if they're not doing anything. I think it's high time for citizens to begin to hold themselves accountable and hold government accountable. And it's high time for government to begin to allow citizens to hold them accountable. No jailing because you ask question, no put um, uh, uh, taking to DSS custody because you ask, ask question. You are a citizen, you demand answers to your question. I think the basic thing is let's begin to preach for good governance and we'll see good government. Thank you so much, uh, Mukta Halilu Modibo and uh, Mr. Ndekabari Anna. Thank you so much for your conversation. It's pretty interesting. I hope that we can um, continue doing what, what, what we must do. Thank you for having me. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, how safe is conducting the Edo governorship election come September 2020? We'll be right back.